Welcome to Speak for Yourself, sponsored by the Popeye's Chicken Sandwich. Oh, we're going to need it's it after this block. show. What? It's always a good show when you start talking Popeye's early. For real, that five-piece chicken tender. Let me get it crispy. You spicy. have the menu memorized. I do. <laughs> Buttermilk biscuits. Let me get two side of fries. Diet Coke. Mm. Keep it going. Man, your auto over there. All that and a Diet Coke. You're that guy. I'm okay, let's get to those show. calories. Let's get it started with big news in Jacksonville. My old stomping grounds in Tim Tebow. Oh, man, he's been released by the Jaguars. Former quarterback trying to make the squad as a tight end, but he was part of the first round of cuts today. Tebow had a rough first preseason game with zero catches and a couple blocking attempts that did not go so well, let's just say that. So Tebow tweeted, thankful for the highs and even the lows. I love that. The opportunities and the setbacks. Never wanted to make decisions out of fear of failure, and I'm grateful for the chance to have pursued a dream. Thank you to the Jaguars organization and everyone who has supported me in this journey. I'm here, Tebow, and we know that God works all things together Amen. for good. Yes, Romans 8, 28. Amen and I ain't talking that. about August 28th, y'all. Yeah, this morning, Jags head coach Herbert Meyer was asked about Tebow's release. Listen. You know, we knew that was an uphill battle for Tim, and, and uh, players loved him, locker room loved him, but uh, it was the right thing. Is this the end of the road for Tim? NFL, professional football? I would guess it is. You know, we didn't get that deep with it. Obviously, he's his own man. Um, uh, elite, elite warrior, elite competitor, uh, but he's also 34 years old. So, Hacho, ah, was it the right move by the Jaguars to release Tebow now? No, it honestly wasn't. Um, they should have released him yesterday. Um, so let's be real. Um, the Jacksonville Jaguars did not release Tim Tebow because they found out he could not play the position. It's not what happened. That's not what happened? Okay. Not what happened. Break it the down. Jacksonville Jaguars released Tim Tebow because we found out he couldn't play the position. I'll give you some of that. Damn, T, you talking about Tebow? The Lord have say. Oh, Tebow, you got that power. I'm a believer. I'm a, I hope it stayed this way. Hey, Tebow didn't do that. T, what do you mean Tebow didn't do that? I said Tebow did do that. No, you better know let that. Let there be light. Yes. And then there was light. Oh, I love life. <laughs> Keep going with your take. I dare you. I, I dare you. I never now. dare you. Tebow? <laughs> Tebow? Tebow, no, I'm on this side. You saw he was still lit over here. He still had a little light over here. <laughs> I'm with you, Tebow. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm low-key should. Y yes, you are. I know you're not supposed to talk about one of God's prophets like that. Um, but uh -huh. I have to do my job, Lord. Oh, you about to be I got to do my job. <laughs> um, the Jaguars did not cut Tim Tebow because they found out he was sorry. They cut Tim Tebow when we found out he was sorry. That always happens in life, Cell. You don't really punish somebody until everybody else sees what happened. And as a result, you now have to punish them in order to avoid backlash. Tim Tebow's been practicing for roughly two and a half weeks now with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm. I'm sure during the course of practice, he has gone up against better defensive ends than he went up against in the third and fourth quarter of that Cleveland Brown preseason game versus the Jaguars. Which... So now you get released. You get released now once we, the viewer, the fan, the analyst, the audience, finds out he can't play the position. You already knew he couldn't play the position. And by you, I mean everyone associated with the Jacksonville Jaguars staff and roster. Mm -hmm. They all knew. But when we found out, it's like, uh-oh, he got to go. So that is my first thought. Oh, I got thoughts. The other reason <laughs> Tim Tebow had to be released, yeah. and I'm going to give you three primary reasons that Tim Tebow had to be released. Rule of three. Number one. Rule of three. Tim Tebow was ruining the integrity of the Jacksonville Jaguars roster. Poor stop. He's ruining the integrity. <laughs> you cannot have the best 90 football players on the team what? see Tim Tebow play and still really believe that that roster has full integrity. Number two, what? Tim Tebow was undermining the legitimacy of the Jacksonville Jaguars roster. Don't sit here and tell me that we are trying to compile all of these players to breed the best competition and let that be a part of the competition. Number three, Tim Tebow was ruining the potential credibility of head coach Urban Meyer. Marcellus Wiley has been there. I have been there. Fans, you may not have. But every day, the head coach during training camp will stand in front of the team meeting and will utter these words. Mm. Men, we're going to put the 53 best players we can put on this team, along with the practice squad players. Man, right now we have the 90 best players that we can assemble, and we're going to make sure the competition is great. You can't claim to have the 90 best players possible if Tim Tebow is out there putting that on tape. So, Tim Tebow 
Being a part of the roster was going to ruin the credibility of Urban Meyer. He was going to ruin the legitimacy of the roster, and he was going to ruin the integrity of the roster. As a result, mm. the Jaguars did do the wisest decision in releasing Tim Tebow. Oh, okay. All I right. made it through that tape. Yeah. <laughs> I made it through. Boy, Boy you, but the afterlife is going to be different for you now. You talk about <laughs> t like that. Um, no, it's not the right move, uh, but I understand why they did it. Um, this is going to be a little more nuanced, and I like it because I like to go out there to the extremes. Um, I'm extremely in love with Tim Tebow as a person. I was in like with him as a player. Amen. Um, uh, <laughs> shut up. I got a tone for my sins. How you do I got a tone for my sins, y'all. Oh, man. But... Uh, in this take right here, I want to just start off and say Tim Tebow was in violation of the relationship he had with Urban Meyer that gave him the opportunity in the first place. Mm. Here's the violation. Urban Meyer, silently but deadly, mentioned to Tim Tebow without having to say it non-verbally. Look, there's one reason I'm going to cut you and only one reason I'm going to cut you. I don't need you to go out there and prove you're good. Just don't prove you're bad. That's the, that's the, that's the code. Look, you my homeboy, you my neighbor, you my best friend, I'm going to hook you up. But there's one thing you can't do. You can't go out there and show them you can't do it. You can go out there and ball all you want, and everybody be like, yeah, pat me up back. I'm like, whatever, I'm just hooking the homie up. It ain't that serious. It ain't that deep. Our team is not built from the bottom up. It's built from the top to the bottom. That's why this is funny to me that I'm even up here defending Tim Tebow, because we are leading a show, a nationally, excuse me, internationally shown television show with an A block that's based on a first level cut from 90 to 85. First round of cuts. We never do that because you know why? These dudes don't count, including Tim Tebow. But Tim Tebow was in violation of his code with Urban Meyer. Now, Urban Meyer sitting there like, damn it. Don't give them a reason that leaves me no choice. Mm -hmm. And he did. Okay, now that's why Tim Tebow got cut. That's why I understand why they did it. But did he deserve an opportunity? Oh, absolutely. Let's get into this opportunity conversation. All right, first of all, let me just preface everything by saying I never get bothered by a sorry player <laughs> or a player in transition or a player fighting his way onto a roster being on the team with me. You know why? Because that's for the sorry players to worry about. I'm not bothered by Tim Tebow being the 90th man. Unless I'm the 89th or 91st man. <laughs> Everybody else on the team is sitting there like, Coach, it don't matter what's going on at the bottom. Matter of fact, it's not going to happen in the second round of cuts. Even the third round of cuts. There are a couple guys you're going to sit there and say, Ooh, him? Damn, we could have used him. But be real about this. Once week one starts, Coach is still going to sit up there as you address the camera as Urban Meyer and still be talking to some sorry players. All 53 ain't playing. All 44 ain't playing like that dress. Dog, there's like 30-some dudes that play. And of those 30, not all of them are playing well. So the point of us now taking Tim Tebow and using him as a poster child of how to be inept in with your opportunity, it's kind of laughable because it happens all the time in the NFL where we are dressed up and spread with guys who just can't live up to the task. But here you hit the nail on the head with the first few sentences of your take. Tim Tebow is like the owner's son who has the job but shows up late with coffee stains on their shirt. Mm -hmm. It's like, bruh, I could have kept you employed, but you can't stick out that bad. I feel you. And the problem was Tim, Tim Tebow stuck out that bad. But did he? The owner, did he? he did. Oh. And here's why. I'm going to tell y'all a quote that I know Marcellus Wiley has heard. I don't know if y'all have ever heard it. <clears throat> Shaheed Khan, the owner, he may be able to lie to us. Head coach Urban Meyer, he may be able to, he may be able to lie to us. Uh -huh. The Jaguars players, they may be able to lie to us, but you know what they say, Sal? The big eye in the sky, it don't lie. Mm. The big eye in the sky don't lie. What is the big eye in the sky? It is the camera. Come on, it right. is the game tape. Shot, huh? It is the film. Shot, huh? And as I look at it, the film done told the truth about Tim Tebow. Staff tried to lie to us. You know, he's in good shape. He looks really good. He can come in here and contribute. Come on, man. Ownership tried to lie to us. Man. You know what? He's know. been a leader. He's been this. He's a savvy veteran. But the big eye in the sky, it has never told a lie a mm. day in mm. its life. Mm. And it told the truth on Tim Tebow at the tight end position. Let's go. Other thing you got to remember is this, though. What? Tim Tebow was the 90th man on the roster. He wasn't 83rd. He wasn't 82nd, not 81st. Mm -hmm. You had to release five, release five people by the day at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Three of the Jaguars that were released were waived injured. 
The other two, one was Tim Tebow and one was a cornerback out of the University of Georgia, which means Tim Tebow was either the 89th or 90th man on the roster. What was the reason, as Cardi B said? What? Why was he there in the first place? Every team the has 90 guys 90th to start. man What's on the that? roster. What's wrong and what, Because what he did is he stole 16 plays from somebody. No, he didn't. How did he not? No, he didn't. He stole, okay. six, he stole 16 okay. plays from somebody. I'm let you talk. Stole a job from somebody. Oh, okay. He stole competition from uh, somebody. Mm -hmm. So you know there is nothing worse. Sorry, we got to talk ball on this show, y'all. There's nothing worse than going up against somebody, and I'm not saying this is Tim Tebow. But Say it if it is. There's nothing worse than going up against somebody who's so sorry that you wasted a rep. Can I take you there for a second? I'm listening. Can you go back to the late 90s, I'm go listening. back to the early 1000s, go back to the <laughs> late 90s? I'm so old. There's nothing worse, Sal, <laughs> than when you know this, you go up and y'all do one-on-ones, one-on-ones. Sal, get up here. I don't know what they called you. Maybe they called you that dude. That dude, get up here. Get up front. Get up front. You go up to the front of the line. You put your hand down. You know wait, wait, I, I took a lot longer than that. <laughs> you, get it, you put his hand down. You probably got his you probably got that hand back. You already know that you got cocked, hand back. Cocked and ready. And you go up against the third string offensive tackle. You don't even have to give him a move. You just strictly beat yeah. him with speed. You yeah. get a sack. Yeah. You're like, yeah. I didn't even get better that yeah. rep. Well, you just well, wasted confidence that did. rep. <laughs> confidence may have just, you didn't even get to work on good. technique. No slap, well, rip, well. no club, no long arm. Think about it. If I you went up against Tebow. Mm -mm. In camp, I'm not gonna let you do it. I didn't even get better. I did get better. I'm gonna tell you why. There's more pressure going against the third string dude than the starter who's a beast itself. You know why? Because there's no way I should lose that rep. I hate it. You actually took me to a place I used to hate. Why am I going against sorry? It's the only upside for him. Now I'm sitting there like, all right, I'm gonna get some confidence because I just went by him. Everybody gonna say, ooh, Wiley gonna get 900 sacks this year. No, I'm not. And two, I don't get to play against these type of guys. And three, there was a slight chance that kid who was a five-star at Auburn, who was a seventh rounder in the NFL, could have just caught me slipping. No. And then all of a sudden, everybody giggling at me. How you let him block you? I used to hate those moments. Let me tell you another moment I hate. This moment right now. Because we are talking about a 90th man on the roster. Last time I checked, all 32 teams have 90 men on their yes, roster sir, before true. this moment. Last time I checked, the only people bothered by the 90th man is 89 and 91. So if you sorry, you mad. Because Tebow took your opportunity. But let me remind you, sorry player, that he didn't take Jack from you. Because the cream rises to the top. And guess what? The dreams, they sink to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So if you just out there being a dreamer and you can't ball, guess what? You're going to be like Tim Tebow. Get your butt cut. Now let's talk about Tim Tebow, why he should have had an opportunity like he did. Because he didn't stick out that bad. I keep reminding you. Huh? Here's the, right? here's the tight end room. He didn't stick out that bad? Tyler Davis, how many career catches does he have? He's, high, he's higher than him on the depth chart. How many career catches? Oh, yeah, you ain't saying nothing because that's how many he has. Zero. How about Ben Ellison? Who's higher than Tim Tebow on, his dra um, on the <sighs> depth chart as well? How many he have? Oh, you said something. That's one. That's right. One career catch. And let's talk about Chris Manhurst. Oh, he out there getting it. 12 career catches in a career in your sixth year and six last year. So he doubled his damn production in one year. Oh, Tim Tebow had an opportunity. He just messed it up. Now, let's talk about this. Since we watched the preseason game and we highlighted Tim Tebow, did we highlight the fact that uh, the number one depth chart, Chris Manhurst, only had one catch? Nope. Did we highlight his blocking? No. Nope. What about Luke Farrell? One catch, two yards. Nope. <sighs> ben Ellison, no nope, catches. We're not doing none of that. Oh, look, I'm going to give you this. I didn't see I Tim Tebow in practice. I, took I need to help you. <laughs> I didn't I see Tim it. Tebow in practice. I don't know if he had bricks with fingers for hands. I don't know if he couldn't block mm -hmm. in practice. But I know that this is up. This is upsetting me because if you brought Tim Tebow in to transition to a new position and to truly make this team, he should have more lives than that based on this tight end. No! So don't lie to the audience first and foremost. I'm never lying. I don't judge every defensive end by the number of sacks they have. And you know that better than me. Largely I do, though. Sure, okay, but not that's entirely. why I got cut. <laughs> because I also want to know, how did they play the run? No, you don't keep your job playing the run. You, but you can lose it not playing the run. You, yeah, you can lose you, it not you playing the run. Keep it if you get them sacks, no matter what you do. That is fair. I can that job is fair. on the field. But what I'm not going to say is this. <laughs> okay, go. None of the other tight ends had catches, thus they're the equivalent or near the equivalent of Tim Tebow. Because you can't compare everybody that has sacks. Some defense, Tim what Tebow... About Career, got though. cut because he could not block in such a manner that stuck out like such a uh, like such a just a sore thumb. I'm giving you that. I'm like it, you it that. just you said it. That's why I'm not even mad at you. You said it, Tebow. You didn't have to be good.
Mm -hmm. Just don't be bad. Mm -hmm. And the problem was he was bad. Tim Tebow had to be released because everybody is watching that tape and is watching that tape and saying, Coach, you can't keep him on the roster. That's if, not you, why. if you keep him on the roster, what does that say about what we're building here in Jacksonville? What are y'all building Everything, in Jacksonville? What now, have you built? <laughs> now at least they're building something. No, 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 no do that here, to Jacksonville. Here's, here's why I speak so passionately okay. about this matter. Because okay. you, at least at some point in time, were the fifth person on the roster, maybe the fourth person on the roster, maybe the third person on the roster. You, you might have even been the first. Uh, but there's a quarterback on the team, so it's hard press for me to believe that you were the first. But it was Drew Brees. He was young. Oh, no, no, I, but I'll you were there. That. I'll give you that. I was only ever... From the 35th to like the 60th person on the roster. The reason I say 60th, two times in my NFL career, I made the team after final cuts, and I got released on Monday of game week. Okay. So that lets me know I was right around 53rd. Yep. I made the team, got cut. So I know the plight of the bottom of the depth chart. Mm. I know the plight of the person competing I against I'm Tim Tebow. I'm hearing I walked it. up to my special teams coach, Dave Fitt, before training camp in Philly, and he said, hey, Acho, you have your work cut out for you. I do believe you can make this team. So I speak from a place of Tim Tebow has been robbing somebody their special teams reps. How's and you can make rob, the team though? on special How teams. How is that a rob? Because you saw Tebow couldn't play the position. I saw he couldn't block. I saw he couldn't play the position. And they saw he couldn't play the position. But then that's so why you let him play? out there for. Hold on, Tama Acho, some people are gamers. Respect that. Let's not argue so much that we don't respect. Some people don't practice but well. But Tebow is a practicer. I, I don't know that. Well, you do because of his Florida speech. <laughs> I promise <laughs> that from this day forward, okay, we will be the too. toughest practicing okay. team yeah. in football. And that was said after a game. Then this day <laughs> forward. So you ball. know he a practicer. I don't know that. Okay, I'm a, I just got to keep it real. Tim Tebow only robs those who already been robbing themselves. If you on the borderline of the NFL, ain't nobody lo loving you. Ain't nobody got no. First of all, get equality out your head, brother. This ain't equal. So Tim Tebow, I don't know if he deserved an opportunity, but he got an opportunity. Now, that opportunity is only robbing somebody who probably doesn't deserve it or just barely got one in the first place. So who is he robbing? Somebody who has See, nothing? This, I hate that speech. No, 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 no. I hate that speech. Let me finish. Because you, you're killing me in word count right now. Um, <laughs> we're talking two different NFLs. And I respect that. We are. But you don't get cut in the NFL because of bad blocks. Well, we saw that went viral. You get cut when you don't want to commit to blocking. There's a huge difference. Fair. A bad block is this. Oh, oh, God, Lord, what happened to me? A bad block is this. Oh, I whiffed on him. But when you don't want to commit, when you don't want to stick your nose in it, when you don't want to go out there and see how hot it really is in that building, then coach is looking at you like you gave them a viral moment. This is another viral moment. Because Tim Tebow got cut on the first round of cuts and is leading every single damn show, which is asinine. But the point is, Tim Tebow should have known he had special circumstances. But I think Tim Tebow was also thinking because of those special circumstances, maybe I would have more lives. I love this. It was a bad here, block. Here's the beauty blocks. of this show, y'all. You get two completely different NFL experiences. You get top 100, you get bottom 100. <laughs> but we both sitting at this desk. So y'all going to get the entire spectrum of the NFL experience. You get cut in the NFL for a couple reasons. Let's go. And I know, because I've been cut <laughs> more than you, so give me this one, big dog. Mm. You can get cut because you don't commit. Yeah. Or you can get cut because you are incapable. Okay. And Tim Tebow got cut in my mind because he was incapable. So I wanted to cover running backs as best as I possibly could. LaShawn McCoy, one-on-one, -on -one, let's go, baby. It's me and you, Shady. But physically, anatomically, based upon my hips and the way in which they pronate inward, I was <laughs> incapable mm. of opening up like some other linebackers mm. and getting out my break, T-step mm. and coming downhill, mm. et cetera. Mm. It wasn't a matter of want to. wasn't a matter of desire. wasn't a matter of mental. It was a matter of physical limitations. Yeah, yeah. At least physical limitations at the time. Tim Tebow was physically limited at the time from being able to do the job. Mm. And that is why he got cut, and that is why he needed to get cut, because somebody else is at least physically capable. You know what they say. Mm. I can't make you fast, but I can make you faster. Mm -hmm. I can't make Tim Tebow able to block. Give me somebody that can block. I can make you block better, but I can't make you block. I can't make you catch, but I can make you catch better. Tim Tebow was just in capable uh, uh, of doing it at this junction in time because he has no reps. This could be the... 
This could be the whole show. It should be. It ain't about all reps. I converted. I was a, breathe. I was a running back my entire life to my junior year in college. Mm -hmm. Kick returner and running back. Check the tape. All of a sudden, they come up to me one day. We got this all-world running back that we recruited. He going to get reps. Marcellus, we don't want to rob you of our, your reps. You're our best player. But we think your future is on defense at defensive end. I made the transition. There was a fear that I wasn't ready for that transition. Because in the trenches, it's warfare. It's hood life, alley life, right? Running back is like everybody hitting you, but you got the ball. You got a chance to get away from all that. In the trenches, it's hog on hog, bro, all day, every day. They were scared if I was ready for that moment. Tim Tebow wasn't incapable physically of playing that position at 34 with his muscles. You know what he was? I got muscles. He, you know what he was? He wasn't predisposed and he didn't have the natural disposition to want to go in there and go get it. As simple as that. <gasps> and look, I was ready to do it. So when they thought that I couldn't, it was like this. Oh, he ain't scared. Tip, I hate to say this. Tebow was scared. No. Yes, he was. No. It wasn't about physicality. Here's it wasn't why. about his age. Here's it wasn't about anything anatomically. He, no. right here, didn't Don't commit to what he had to go do. Here's the thing. And yeah, I, he should have been given more time I to will, figure that I out. I will claim to at least know Tim Tebow better than the majority of people watching Come this on, show. Man. I would say I know him better than you. I played with him for five months. Obviously, I know him. Of what y'all know about Tim Tebow, about if we're going to doubt something, I would never doubt Tim Tebow's mental toughness or his mental application. I've given you the story before. We have Go. to do drills in Philadelphia, some, uh, 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 something called Axon reps. It is a mental repetition game. Tim Tebow one day did 2,500 of the drills from one practice to the next. The entire linebacker room, all 10 of us, did 700 of those reps to the point where we got cussed out because Tim Tebow, who's there mm. the third-string quarterback, mm. is doing more repetitions of post-practice work than our entire linebacker room. That is at least to me a, a, a sign of mental application. Tim Tebow is the same Tebow who was seen with blood running down his face back at Florida. It's the same Tim Tebow who we know is mentally tough. Mm -mm. I'm not going to say that Tebow was essentially implying that he was scared or at least not mentally tough. I'm not tough. implying that. I'm saying it. I no, saw it. No. Nothing about I'm Tim Tebow. I'm not Tebow, implying that. Nothing Jack. about Tim no. Tebow says scared. Yeah, nothing yes, about does. the history yes, of Tim Those Tebow's right there, life no. says scared. No, no, no. Not his life. Capable. His life changed. He got into a real game, and it wasn't even real. It was just the realest he ever been in. Preseason game as a tight end. Let me tell you, I used to play running back like this. I'm like, you ain't going to get, oh, that hurt. Whatever, I'll be back. When you got your hand in dirt, and it's a man that looks like a security guard at the club, and he got six homies with him, and they all coming for you. Tim Tebow did not commit to that moment of truth. I give it to you like this. I always tell kids this. They say, what's the scariest thing about football? I say it's this. Somebody gets off the bus, and you look, them, and you look at him, you say, he look like he can play, not that he can't play, right? And then you see him warming up, and you're like, oh, he look amazing. Oh, I know I'm good. I got my wristbands. I'm ready to war, too. And then that ball gets kicked off. And 80,000 people that used to be with you, they quiet. And you don't hear Jack. And then it's you and him going at each other. I don't care about your workout apparatus. I don't care about your combine numbers. I care about do you want it more than me? Now, you think that Tim Tebow wanted it? If they would have said, Tim Tebow, this one block is to determine the fate of your life. You think he going to go up there and do this? He was scared. Yes. He was scared. No, he couldn't. Sal, so, you could. Am I am I'm I'm up to He was here. scared. You could have told me. You, you could have said, I, I, hey, Acho, this I one coverage repetition will save your life. You versus LaShawn McCoy, 2014 in Philly. It's not a matter of being scared that I can't guard him. He is cut on a dime by his Instagram and Twitter handles for a reason. We gotta get I out of this. am not. All I it's know. It's not a matter of fear. You stop comparing yourself to Tim Tebow. I'm comparing the that physical was not limitations. A, no, that was not a physical incident right there. That was a mental incident. No, sir. I'm trying to tell you. I've seen him. I lined up against him. They helped me get paid. I know it when you don't want it. Mm. He just didn't want You don't know what it's like me. to be sorry in the NFL. <laughs> so stop talking about sorry people in the NFL. Come up in the you leave that to me. <laughs> I know what they look like, though. Somebody the take the lights. The Nets in the playoffs, and they look like Tebow. But they do have a better big three. That's the question. Woo, that had to be a record of an eight block. We'll tell you which group of stars we'd rather have, but first... <sighs> That Prescott may sit out the entire preseason. Tell you if that concerns us at all. Next on Speak for Yourself, Tebow had more in him than that, and it ain't physical. Let's head to Dallas, because Zach Prescott was limited in practice Monday, and the Cowboys say they're being cautious about yes. his return. Now, head coach Mike McCarthy says 
There's no urgency to play his quarterback in Saturday's third preseason game. And added, if he misses that, he will not play the rest of the preseason. So, Sell, now that he has calmed down. Okay. No, no, we didn't really have it. Because the whole break, we were still going at it. Tebow was scared. This should have gave him another week. We will be back with Tebow. Yes, we are coming back to in about 30 minutes. Yes. But, Sell, so, yes. you worried about Dak Prescott if he misses all the preseason? No, not worried at all. Um, look. Yeah, they need preseason. Um, we we kind of alluded to this in the conversation about Tim Tebow, but preseason is not for everyone. Um, Sean McVay is now becoming the poster man, not child, of this in terms of how he wants to run his organization. But I'll just tell you like this. We didn't need preseason in college. Why in the hell we need it as pros? First and foremost. Second of all, let's talk about recent quarterbacks who've had success then nah, maybe they didn't need preseason. Let's start with the man Dak Prescott himself. Uh, nearly 6,800 passing yards through the first four games. I wonder if he had preseason action last year. No, he didn't. Wow. Why? Nobody did. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers leads Packers to the NFC Championship game. Beast. wonder if he had preseason in 2019. Nope. Didn't have it at all. What about Jared Goff? You talking about Aaron Rodgers, of course. He don't need it. Jared Goff needed it. 2018 leads Rams to the Super Bowl. No preseason action. Can y'all miss me with this whole we need preseason to get sharp? How are we getting sharp? Preseason speed is not regular season speed. It's not even close. Like, one, the caliber of opponent is not the same. And two, the speed of the game is not the same. So thank you for Sean McVay and other coaches out there that are thinking forward, who are thinking, hey, why do I want to risk my players potentially getting injured, in a moment that is not going to sharpen their knives. It's a dull experience that potentially can be risky. So Dak Prescott, who has something going on with his shoulder, needs to rehab. He needs to be available for the regular season, not going out there in the preseason against guys who are going to get cut one day and showing that he's still better than them. No preseason for Dak Prescott. Fine with it. So I am worried if he misses all of the preseason, but I have to preface with this. <clears throat> Context matters. Always. Context always matters. Yes. So you can run around all of California. You can run around all of Los Angeles. You're fine. But let you be on house arrest and run around all of California and all around Los Angeles, it will be an issue. <laughs> Same action, but there's a different context. So I am not going to sit here and act like Aaron Rodgers needs to play in the preseason. Patrick Mahomes needs to play in the preseason. I wouldn't even say that Tom Brady needs to, although he did. Greatest of all time played last week. Well, there you go. But I will say this, for Dak Prescott, who hasn't played since early October of last year, mm. for Dak Prescott, who is nursing now not one but two injuries, his ankle, we need to know is he fully recovered from, oh. and his shoulder, oh. yes, I do think he should play in the preseason. But in all honesty, they're doing a Dak Prescott a disservice not playing him. And the reason I say it is this, Dak Prescott, the first time he will ever be touched on a football field, will be in a regular season game versus a reigning Super Bowl champions. Mm -hmm. Sal alluded to this yesterday. Mm -hmm. Quarterbacks wear different jerseys, black jerseys, red jerseys, et cetera, at practice. Mm -hmm. That not only means you cannot hit them. Mm. In actuality, it means do not even touch the quarterback. Defensive linemen, if you come clean on a blitz, don't touch him. No nope. coach will blow the whistle. We know you, he was sacked. Do not touch him. So Dak Prescott's first touch, not hit, his first touch will be against the reigning Super Bowl champions. That's not doing Dak Prescott a service. There's always an adjustment period. You at home know this. Say you don't run for a while, then go out on a concrete and run two or three miles. You get shin splints. Why? Because your body is adjusting to the fact that you haven't run for a while. Now, after you get shin splints and they dissipate, you won't get them again in a week because your body's now adjusted. Dak Prescott. He's now going to have to adjust sale to his first hit, to his fatigue, to everything after the first regular season game. I don't even think they're doing him a service. Mm. Give him a series. Give him, give him two <laughs> series. Give him three series. Give yeah. him a quarter. Yeah, yeah. Five passing plays. Yeah. But don't just roll him out there yeah. against the best pass rushing duo the last two years, at least based on statistics of what they did two years ago. And like, all right, Dak, have at it. Good luck on national television. Rooting for you. Can't do that, man. Man, you can do that, and it's been done to the success of those I've mentioned, even those who are less as players, Jared Goff, than Dak Prescott, and still they had tremendous success without preseason action. First of all, Dak is paid too much to be out there trying to risk it. 
especially when it doesn't count. Like, let's get this equality out of our head once again. He's too bougie for this. He's too rich for this. If that gets hurt, gets touched in the preseason, what you going to say then? Oh, well, maybe he shouldn't have been playing. Or, no, it was necessary. It wasn't a necessary evil. I used to believe, like you, that preseason is a necessary evil. If coach ever walked up to us and said, who wants to play in the preseason? I would never raise my hand. But I know I should because it's a necessary evil. I'm starting to respect that less and less by the day. Even a Justin Fields, who's played one game in the NFL, and that's not even a real game. It's a preseason game. Said, yeah, the game kind of felt slow. <laughs> you know why? Because Justin Fields is like, man, this ain't sharpening my knives. So what is it for? If it's the risk-reward relationship is starting to get skewed to the risk, especially in Dak's case, why are we doing it? For a cumulative in four games, three games now, in a cumulative quarter and a half of football over three games, we want to see if Dak Prescott can get touched. What the hell? What kind of logical equation is that? That's not how you run a franchise, and that's not how you treat your star player. I need to see you play one series here, uh, two series here, against some scrubs there, and then it tells me you're ready. How about just wait till it's time to go, and I'll be ready. So let him rehab. Let him get himself fully capable and healthy. And let's see it when it matters, because this right now just doesn't matter. I think a couple things. Number one, okay. if okay. Dak Prescott's playing in the first or second quarter, he's not playing against scrubs. Like, let's, let's, we throw that around right. too loosely on no, TV. No, we don't, because too many guys are not playing in the preseason. I'm, you going to see Aaron Donald out there? No. This entire preseason? But Aaron Donald's backup is not a scrub. The fourth teamer may be a scrub. We can look at the depth chart. So it's that person tell me during the next break. Aaron Donald's backup will not be a scrub. He may not be Aaron Donald. Hold on. But let's, like, when if we say you scrubs, ever in practice and coach say you get to go against First of all, we usually go against the second team. Why? Because they're not going to stress us the same. Not first the same. team versus second team. Good. Now, when he said first on first, I'm like, it's a scrimmage, coach. What you doing? So, so I, I, I don't know. When I was starting second team, there was a difference. Of course. Right. But I think that's the difference that Dak Prescott needs. Why? Like, I'm fine. Left. It's the same team. He has 6,800 pass yards last year with no preseason it's, action through four games, and he needs something it's now? It's the same thing, and we talked about yesterday. If you're training for a marathon, you don't go out day one and run 26.2 miles. You go out and you run five miles. Then you run a seven-mile run. Then you do a 13 mile run then you work up and maybe you do a 15 and then you run a marathon you don't just go out there hey, i'm gonna run a marathon today try and see what happens y'all just wake up one day and run a marathon you will body will hold be in shock and you, you don't you work your way up you don't think dax in football playing shape we know he can't be in football playing shape because he's not playing football and you and i have both said on this show yeah. that the only way to get in football playing right. shape is to play ball but time out you're not understanding let's not argue did he play in the preseason last year no sir did he start off with 6,800, like, on pace for 6,800 yards? There was nothing wrong with that except an acute injury. Acute injuries can happen anytime, any place. That is not about conditioning. That's about you in the wrong place at the wrong time, brother. I'm just not understanding. I'm trying to walk with you because you can convince me it's a necessary evil. But I don't see it. The place, don't, Jared Goff went to the Super Bowl. No preseason. Aaron Rodgers. The NFC place I game. need you to walk with me is this. Where? The context. If Dak was fully healthy, I'd be, I do not think Aaron Rodgers needs to play in the preseason. I do not think Tom Brady needs to play in the preseason. I do not think Patrick Holmes need to play in the preseason. I am not saying all quarterbacks or Jared Goff back when he was with the Rams need to play in the preseason. The only reason so I think Dak needs to mm. is what's up with your shoulder? Is it going to fatigue or not? Because I don't want you to get into the third quarter of the regular season game mm. and all of a sudden we got to bring in our backup Garrett Gilbert because we didn't know what you got. At least if you play in the preseason and you go out there and you throw 12 passes and you feel it, then now we know how to prepare for the regular season. You know what? Let's keep another quarterback on the roster. Because there might be a chance that Dak well, gets Well, why don't hurt. we prepare like it potentially can fatigue? Like, you're telling me to run a marathon, and I'm saying, well, I'm hurt. And you said, well, still train for it like you got to run. I said, well, why don't we just wait for the marathon? I'll be ready. Because I've already trained up to this point. Dak has already been in football shape in a general sense. You want it to be specific. And if he gets hurt in the preseason, I don't think that conversation is going to sound the same. Coming up, the Bucks are NBA champs. Yeah, but. We'll tell you if they have a better big three than the Brooklyn Nets. Acho, what is up with this show today? That's next. Don't speak for yourself. What? After an intensely personal face-to-face, -face, what does John Cena have planned for the head of the table, Roman Reigns, tonight before they clash for the championship at SummerSlam? The summer of Cena continues. It's an all-new Friday Night SmackDown, live at 8 Eastern, 7 Central on Fox. 
The Bucks are fresh off of winning their first NBA title in 50 years. A lot of their success was because of their top stars. Bleacher Report ranked the NBA's top big threes, and the Bucks combo of Giannis, Chris Middleton, and Drew Holiday came in second behind the Nets. KD, Harden, and Kyrie. Joined now by Fox NBA analyst Slick Rick the Buker, but Acho, which big three would you rather have, the Nets or the Bucks? Uh, I would easily rather have the Bucks big three. Now, let me clarify this. I would rather have the Bucks three best players. The Bucks do not have a big three, and we're not going to start acting like the Bucks have a big three now to undermine what Giannis has accomplished, to undermine Chris Middleton's growth over the last several years, and all of a sudden to propel Drew Holiday into a figure that he is not when he is one of the greatest overachievers that we have seen as of late. So we're not going to act like the Bucks have a big three and retroactively change the narrative of what they accomplished and how incredible it was. But... For the sake of this conversation, I would still rather have the Bucks' three best players than the Nets' three best players because we have to take everything into consideration. If you all were to tell me in a utopian society, in this perfect world where injuries weren't a thing, where Kyrie wasn't distracted when he was called the N-word by a black player, where Kevin Durant was not always on social media or injured, where James Harden was always in shape, in this utopian society, sure, I take the next big three. Mm. But if y'all telling me 2021 Ooh. here on planet Earth, where we actually live, where Kyrie Irving does miss time often, where James Harden is not always in shape, and where Kevin Durant can be swayed at times by his emotions, then give me the old reliable bucks. I'll give you a full screen and I will get off of my microphone and my high horse, please. There have been a little over, I believe, 300 or 400 potential games to have been played amongst all of those players the last two seasons. The Bucks' three best players, Drew Holiday, Giannis, and Middleton, they play 88% of the time. The Nets' big three, they only play 54% of the time. The last thing I will tell you is this. The Nets' big three played a cumulative, collective, 14 games together this season. The Bucks' three best players played 14 games together in the playoffs and route to winning an NBA championship. Here ends the lesson. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is, this is either going to be a sweep or it's not going to be a fair fight, but it's only going to be one or the other because <laughs> thank you, Emmy. Uh, the truth is there really isn't a big three in either or with either of these teams. There is not a big three with the Bucs for all the reasons that Emmy uh, noted. And there's not a big three with the Brooklyn Nets either. It's really a two plus one. Okay, let's be realistic about that. And for the Bucs, I would not call them a big three. I would call them a perfect triangle. Because you have your point guard and your playmaker. You have your oh, wing player behind. and your scorer. And you have your post player forward, rim protector, whatever you want to call yeah, Giannis. You but you have a perfect balance and complement among those three. There's no redundancy mm. as opposed to, say, the Nets, who have a post player who's never in the post. They have two guys that are scoring point guards, and they don't have anybody who is a lockdown defender at the other end. Meanwhile, with the Bucks, I have two guys who are all team first defense, and a third guy who was given the responsibility of covering Kevin Dar Gar uh, Durant in that series because he is also an accomplished defensive player, top 20 at least twice among defensive win shares, has received votes for all defense. <clears throat> so if you're asking me between the two, I could say that the Nets are more talented. There was oh, never a question okay. about the Nets and whether they were talented but it was a matter of whether they fit. And they haven't proved that yet because they haven't played together yet. Meanwhile, the Bucks was never a question about fit. It was a matter of whether they were good enough. <clears throat> and those rings that they're gonna put on their fingers oh. next fall oh are all the proof you need that they are good enough. Oh, man. 
I need to see your eye toe, too. I know. Take a deep breath, Damn, Marcellus, because you got work to I'm do. Ready. Yeah, you I'm got ready. a lot of work to do if I know where you're going. You already know where I'm going. I'm going where the rest of the world is going. We're taking the Brooklyn Nets. What the hell is wrong with y'all? This is hot takey. This is why I don't like sports media at times, when I just hear something that is just so absurd, so crazy that it just makes me want to leave the barbershop. Like, dog, he's like, hey, 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 I'm not finished cutting your hair. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I get it done somewhere else. I can't hear this ignorance. And this is pure ignorance. And let me just give it to you simply. What are you doing in a barbershop these days? I hate to interrupt. <laughs> hey, this is optional. This ain't by, by, by nature. This oh, is okay. me right. choosing right. to look this cute. All right, here we go. <laughs> Number one, uh, I want to go to Acho's Utopia because he's telling me, well, if you tell me that uh, we wouldn't have any injury concerns and N-word concerns, <laughs> I love you, and uh, they were all in shape. And all I would do is counter by saying, well, I'm just going to take the group that is better, not the sorrier one. The sorrier of these three in terms of talent is obviously the Milwaukee Bucks. How do I know that? Because you guys told me that. When you mention the big three in Brooklyn, you say KD, Harden, and Kyrie. You notice that? Either it's initials, acronyms, or just one word. Acho Emmy over there knows what I'm talking about. That superstar status. But when you mention the big three in Milwaukee, guess what you say? Giannis, because he's one of them. And then you say Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday. Oh, but that's not even a strong argument. Here's a strong argument in sickness, health, poverty, and wealth. You got to take the Brooklyn Nets because they were up in a series against your big three, 2-0. And it was only one and a third of them. <laughs> it wasn't even all three of them. It wasn't even all two of them. It was one and a third. I don't know what two thirds of Harden left him, but he was there limping along with KD. Now, let's be real about this. I need to see Acho. I need to see the hair that needs the haircut. It's coming. I know it's coming. Everyone okay, in that barbershop. I know it's coming. <laughs> um, here we go, guys. We are going to Venice Beach. Hey, Slick, I want you to bring them yellow chucks you wore in the eighth grade. Remember you were talking about that? Okay, we sitting there. <laughs> yes, it's sir. all six of those dudes walking up looking fresh. Got their managers with them, their business managers, their agents, their PR team, all six of them. They sit down. I know your guys will. <laughs> Damn right, they superstars. So here we go. We're all sitting there, and it's time to draft. First pick is KD. Let's stop playing. Second pick is Harden. Let's stop playing. Third pick, hmm, it gets quiet. Is it going to be Giannis or is it going to be Kyrie? Depends on what you want. But the point is, even if you're drafting and you're drafting uh. with your mindset, ain't no way that three of the first four players aren't on the Brooklyn Nets. Case dismissed. The big three is in Brooklyn. Here is the problem with sales logic, America. Slick, you already know it, so I ain't got to talk to you. I'm talking to them. Talking talent. Marcellus Wiley wants to ignore the negative traits and attributes and characteristics that make up an individual and only pay attention to the positives. You move to California, the weather is amazing, but I'm not going to ignore the fact that there are earthquakes. Oh, you go to Nigeria, the greenery is beautiful, but I'm not going to ignore the fact that there's immense poverty. Teslas run incredibly well, but you can't ignore the fact that they're only meant to they're only supposed to be built once. You get into an accident, there is a big issue with a Tesla. Right. I'm not going to ignore realities of a situation and only focus on the positives. If I were to only focus on the positives, yes, I would take the nets. But the problem is, I cannot ignore the earthquakes, the immense poverty, or the fact that they're only meant to be built once. Because the nets, they miss too much time. So give me the players that are going to be present. Give me the players that are actually going to play. And I'm also not taking James Harden over Giannis, but I won't get distracted by that. I think the viewer can understand that Giannis is a better player. But would you than James take Harden. three nets over the first four picks or three nets, correct? Yes, I would well, probably that's take the, the best first four three. picks as three nets. That's the best. But they're three. not present. You know the oh. race, you know the story of the tortoise and the hare. You just want the guy that's going to get out first. Give me old, reliable, who will be present. Mm. Mm. No, 100%. And I hate to go back to something that Acho pointed out at the very beginning, but we're all pretending to be GMs here, right? I mean, yeah. that's really the exercise here. Who would we want for our team? And if I'm the GM, do I want the three guys who left their last teams under a cloud of controversy mm -hmm. and with bad feelings and mm -hmm. one whom I don't know when he's going to ghost me. I just know that at some point he is or one who can't keep to a diet or another one who loves Twitter beasts. 
versus three guys who have demonstrated that they are humble, hungry, and no maintenance. <laughs> and for all the talk about who we're going to take to the courts <laughs> and who we're going to play pickup with, as far as talent is concerned, yeah, first of all, the question of whether you would pick Giannis or Kyrie as the number third is the tell-all, Marcellus, that you are biased to the nth degree. Biased. There would never be a debate there. Most I will give you ever, KD maybe? first, mm -mm. KD? but after that, it's Giannis Antetokounmpo okay. because of what he accomplished this last year. What about year. the next so two that's picks? that's one to one. What about one. the next two picks? Brooklyn, right? I could go, uh, I, could, I would go Harden, Drew Holiday. Or, actually, again, it would be a debate. Because here's this, this is what it comes Holiday back to. Kyrie Irving? You, <laughs> yes, I am. Oh, yes, I Did you see what Drew Holiday did for Team USA? Sometimes it's not about the numbers. Sometimes it's not about the talent. It's about Kyrie a guy who makes other guys better. <laughs> Have you seen Kyrie in the Drew finals? Drew Holiday <laughs> makes other guys better. Well, Kyrie is better. Irving I don't need you to make other guys better. Just be better from other guys. The one thing that holds Kyrie Irving's resume up there is the fact that he won a ring with the Cleveland Cavaliers and he also happened to be with LeBron James. Since then, the numbers look good. The accomplishments, not so much. So oh. yes, I would take Drew Holiday over Kyrie Irving based on what I'm building as a team and what he's done. And this is the thing you can't argue with, Marcellus. I'm arguing. Those three, they proved it. They won a ring. The three guys with the Nets, KD won one with Golden State. Oh. Kyrie won one with Cleveland. James Harden has never won Stores. one. So the idea that those three can come together and be a championship trio simply has not been proved. And the Bucks have. So whatever you want to say about oh. talent or anything oh. else, oh. I got the three that have demonstrated that they can do ultimately what I want them to do and the other three have yet to do that. Thank God that Kevin Durant had that big toe, or we were having a different conversation. Otto, you can't keep giving the me the negative example the of context matters. And I only want to focus in on injury and being present. How about just being better? Like, the negatives for the, for the Brooklyn Nets is just they get hurt. And then y'all can talk about some other issues why they're not present. But they're just better. It's not even a conversation. Four picks, three of them guaranteed to go one, two, I'm saying, and three, Brooklyn. But I'm respecting y'all saying four picks, but three of the four are Brooklyn. You're not even weaving. We're not even snaking this. This is crazy. And then Slick try to come with that Slick talk because I love them. But organizations left in the cloud of controversy. You don't want to have a player on your roster like that. Well, I would have wanted Shaquille O'Neal when he left Orlando, and they were left in a little bit of controversy. I would have wanted LeBron when he left Cleveland the first time, and they were left in a little bit of controversy. Hey, I would have took Kawhi after San Antonio. And look what he did with the Raptors. And they were left in the cloud of controversy. Man, y'all cooking these books up here. Let me not cook books. Only three players in the league on the same team average over 24 points a game. They're all on the Brooklyn Nets. Only one team could say that. Nets, best field goal percentage last year. Nets, second best in three-pointers. <laughs> Y'all gave me an argument about, oh, uh, where's their library card? Uh, uh, are, they, are they donating it? Are they charitable? Uh, do they like hanging out with kids? Like, what the hell y'all talking about? We talking about basketball. You see those three right there? Those three, if they stay healthy, it's a sweep. If they don't stay healthy, he's still up 2-0 with one in the third. If Acho, they come stay on, man. healthy, come on, if man. California didn't have earthquakes, earthquakes if is not Nigeria that bad, was flourishing, earthquakes if, ain't that bad. if, if, here's what it's it is, a big one every now and then. if Marcellus was more team-minded, he was understand our take. But Cell got a track mm. mindset. And Cell is like, just give me the... Best, best individuals and thinks that will correlate mm -hmm. to the best team. What we know, Cell, and what we just recently have seen is the best individuals do not always correlate to the best team. But what do the individuals contribute to the team? I understand your Didn't train of thought. Play? Didn't they just play each other? And when, look, they weren't even healthy from hello. Oh, right, and they hold still on, were up to them. But Acha's making a great point. How is that? That's uh, not a great point. Acha's making a great point. Oh. The Toronto Raptors, talent-wise, were they better than the Golden State Warriors? No, sir. The Dallas Mavericks, they when they beat the Miami Heat in the Big Three, were they were they more talented no, sir. than Keep the Miami Heat? No, sir. Keep on sick. 
I mean, I could go, <laughs> when you put Steve Nash and Dwight Howard and Pau Gasol together, mm. yeah. and Kobe Bryant, yeah. Yeah. what, didn't you have a ton of talent? Did that, did anything yeah. happen so, so, oh, I get it. There, so you I guys mean, are designing teams could, where you want a team that's not as good, but we're going to stay healthy, and we're going to beat the other team because they're going to get hurt. That's how y'all want to draw no, 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 teams. No, no, no. Okay, that's cool. I, I love to play y'all. I love to play y'all. Well, y'all did. I don't want just talent. talent. I want talent talent. that works together. Oh, yeah, we got a dynasty coming. It's coming. It's right in front of you. Coming up, it sounds like Aaron Rodgers thought last season was his last in Green Bay. I'll tell you if this will actually be his swan song as a Packer. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Up to you. Aaron Rodgers is in Green Bay. Okay, duh. For now, though, he told Peter King recently, and he came back to the Packers because he felt he could be 100% committed and locked in. But there were definitely doubts this offseason, and apparently a year ago, Rodgers said, quote, last year at this time, I was looking at the season as my last year in Green Bay. So, Acho, will this be Aaron Rodgers' last season in Green Bay? Absolutely, Sal. And the reason I know this, I'm assuming you know this, we all should know this, is because he has another year on his deal. After this year, my dog Aaron Rodgers, he got one more. But the kicker is this. The Green Bay Packers are not going to let Aaron Rodgers hit free agency and get nothing Nothing. for him. Say it, brother. What they're not going to do. So what the Packers will do at the end of this season is trade Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. Because at least if you trade Aaron Rodgers, you will get something of immense value in return. Mm. The parallel, for those wondering, remember the... Baltimore Ravens traded Orlando Brown, their beast young left tackle, to the Kansas City Chiefs. Why in God's name would you trade a 24-year-old Pro Bowl left tackle to a team that you can't beat? Huh. Because Orlando Brown was about to hit free agency. Yep. And Orlando Brown's going to hit free agency, and y'all aren't going to be able to keep him. Mm-hmm. So at least Ravens are thinking, let's trade him and get something while we still can before he walks scotch free. <laughs> That's the same incident and same scenario, same scenario the Packers are about to be in. Aaron Rodgers, let's at least get something for him as opposed to playing with him this year, maybe playing with him again next year, but then he walks away free. Yeah, I agree with you. He's gone. This is his last year in Green Bay. Uh, For a different reason, though. I think the real reason beyond, because you can always make the numbers work. Look, this year they reworked his deal and saved $10 in cap space. Next year, (laughs) I saw this. His cap number next year, y'all, is $46.1 million. (sighs) When I played, that was the entire cap of the entire team. Now, it's $46.1 million next year. Now, they could rework it, but they're not going to rework it for my reason. Who would choose to go through this again, this soap opera, this episode with Aaron Rodgers? As they say, ain't no more meat on the bone, homie, because he made them go through it. Talking in circles being vague, saying some names and not saying others. Aaron, what do you really want? Well, I just want a better culture. Aaron, you can't hide behind the word culture. What do you want and be definitive? I want people to be better. What are you talking about? Oh, we finally realized what you're talking about. We did all this. We went through all of this soap opera for a Randall Cobb acquisition and a Clay Matthews tweet. How silly was this? If you're an organization worth billions of dollars and you realize that you've been playing this game of silliness with a player who has a cap number next year of $46 million, oh, it's adios, amigos. Now let's talk about how they got here as well. They used up too much energy in this process, man. I think they just spent... You ever watch basketball games and they always see a team down, usually your team, Milwaukee Bucks against, you know, Brooklyn Nets, big three, I don't know. They up 25 points. And then all of a sudden, you see Milwaukee make a surge, make a surge. Oh, it's tied! It's tied! And then all of a sudden, you see Brooklyn win again by 30. You know why? Because you used up all your energy in the comeback. Aaron Rodgers used up all the energy of this organization just to return back. They used up all their energy trying to get them back on the field for training camp. Now they come to realize... That's it, big dog. We ain't got no more. So this is going to turn into what it should be. A lot of love. A lot of Jordan love. Coming up, Tim Tebow was released today by the Jaguars. I'm still crying. <laughs> but we'll tell you if it was the right move by Jacksonville. It was. It was not. It was. Max Tebow, turn the lights off again. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. I hope he does. <laughs>
messing with the Lord's work. <laughs> Let's get back to the big news in Jacksonville because Tim Tebow was released by the Jaguars Tebow. today. The former quarterback was trying to make the squad as a tight end, but he was part of the first round of cuts from 90 to 85. Now, Tebow had a rough first preseason game with zero catches and a couple of blocking attempts that did not go so well. Jack's head coach Urban Meyer was asked about Tebow's release this morning. Take a listen. You know, we knew that was an uphill battle for Tim, and, and uh, players loved him, locker room loved him, but uh, it was the right thing. Is this the end of the road for Tim, NFL, professional football? I would guess it is. You know, we didn't get that deep with it. Obviously, he's his own man. Uh, uh, elite, elite warrior, elite competitor, uh, but he's also 34 years old. Mm. We got to bring in Fox NFL analyst and new member of the Jaguars broadcast team. That's Bucky Brooks. So, Bucky, settle the score, big dog. Was it the right move by the Jaguars to release Tim Tebow? They had to release Tim Tebow at this point because Urban Meyer is trying to maintain the credibility in the locker room. And if you're talking about winners and losers and picking the best squad and the best 53 are going to be on the roster. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to pop in the tape of the first preseason mm -hmm. game with everybody in there watching mm -hmm. and to say that 85 deserves to continue to be mm -hmm. on the squad. And it's not just the blocking and, and those things, because that's going to be a tough transition for a quarterback to go to play in a position that requires you to be a goon. It's the lack of special teams ability, because we all know, when you are a backup player, if you're not a starter, you got to be on the core special teams unit. Tim Tebow didn't play any snaps of the special teams in that preseason game. All of the others tied in, all were on special teams in some way, shape, or form. And so this was going to be an uphill battle. And it's the lack of blocking and the inability to contribute on special teams that forced the Jaguars to move on from Tim Tebow, despite Urban Meyer having a love affair with his former player. Bucky, you must have been reading my notes, big dog, because my fourth line is he was potentially ruining the credibility of Urban Meyer. I also say he was undermining the legitimacy of the roster. I also think that he was making the integrity of the Jaguars <laughs> call come into question as well. The biggest reason he had to get released was because of what Bucky said. And I'll hone in on that point. It's the credibility piece. If you do not release Tim Tebow now, when not only you, the Jaguars, know that he cannot play the tight end position, but more importantly, we, the media and the entire world, now knows he can't play the position. Now we got to question you. We got to question all the decision makers in Jacksonville. Urban, unfortunately, we'd have to question you. Like, wait a second, Urban. We are not head coaches, nor are we near as great a head coach as you have ever been or will continue to be. But we know he's not that good. So if we can see he's not that good and he's still on the roster, now we're calling into question why he's on the roster. Mm. Because many can assume because y'all won the national championship or national championships together in Florida, but that can't be it. Can't be it at all. We have to assume it's because Tim Tebow can contribute to a winning football team. But now that we know based on play, Tim Tebow can't contribute to a winning football team, if you do not release him, then why is he on the roster? The only reason he can be on the roster is because of some sort of favor, some sort of favoritism. And when it comes down to it, if you show favoritism so blatantly clear, then you lose your credibility instantly. It's one thing to show a little bit of favoritism, but when it is that blinding, all of a sudden we start to look at Urban, we start to look at uh, the owner, Shad Khan, and we're like, Okay, wait a second now. We can't take y'all seriously as management. We can't take y'all seriously as coaches if you're not actually going to keep the best players and if you're so blatantly going to try to retain one of the worst, if not the worst, player. Man, man, man. Disagree with you guys. Um, let me just get into this. I don't think that the Jacksonville Jaguars should have did it at this time. It's the right move to release Tim Tebow if he doesn't improve from what we saw in his first preseason action. But remember... Not only was this his first game preseason action, but it's his first game at a new position. So I think the credibility was already lost in the locker room if you were ever questioning this move. Think about it. Coach brings in Tim Tebow in the offseason. You're sitting there like, why is he here? Okay. Now he comes out there and gets wounded in the first game. He goes viral and everyone's looking at him like he can't play the position at all. He's not even on special teams, as Bucky admitted. Now, if I'm a player in that locker room, all I'm saying is, well, coach him up, coach, and let's see if you can do your job. 
get some of this credibility back. If not, then you release them. Because we're not getting any better from release of 90 players down to 85. These are the scrubs. These guys don't belong on the team in the first place. Why don't you give them to the second round of cuts? Let's see if he can improve. There were bright lights. A lot of guys start slow in the NFL process, especially at a new position. But, Coach, your credibility was already lost. You could have found some of it, but you caved in to all the social pressure. I get it. Now let's talk about this move for real. Because Tim Tebow is in violation as well. I told Acho this before. Look, Urban Meyer was looking at him like, you ain't got to prove to me that you're good. You ain't got to even prove that to your teammates. Just don't prove to the world that you're bad. And Tim Tebow went out there and proved to the world that he's bad. Now, there's no coming back from this moment because he went viral, whatever the hell that means in terms of your employment. But the point is, too many eyeballs on you being inept. I don't like it. I just don't like it at this moment. I thought that in the NFL, when we're trying to see who could really make a team, we're really looking at who could make a team. Because last time I checked, the guys ahead of him on the depth chart have no career receptions, one career reception, and 12 career receptions. Three guys ahead of him. Y'all acting like he got... Travis Kelsey on this squad. This dude is around some other dudes that need to prove themselves. But Tebow wasn't allowed another week to do that same thing. You couldn't give him another week, Marcellus, because the Titans that are on the roster, these guys are designated blockers. They don't have, the Jaguars don't have high hopes or grand expectations for the tight end position to be a marquee position in the passing game. And so if you're hanging your head that your tight ends, both tight ends, are going to be stellar blockers. I don't know how in good faith the position coach, the tight end coach can mm. run the tape with the other four or five guys mm. in the room mm. and talk about Tim Tebow and say, hey, Tim, you got to get better here without everyone looking around like, come on, coach. Come on now. What, what are we doing? And so it reaches a point in the preseason where it's clear. It's abundantly clear when you need to make decisions Coming off of that game with those failed attempts that you saw and even some of the struggles in the passing game, you have a tight end who can't block. You have a tight end who's very limited as a receiver and he doesn't play special teams. What value does Tim Tebow add to the squad? At the end of the day, Bucky, I think mm. they finally realized Tim Tebow added no value as a football player. Mm. Could Tim Tebow have added value as a strength coach? Sure. Can he add value still Man. as some aspect <laughs> on the team? To some degree, yes. But as a tight end, he's not contributing on special teams. He's not contributing in the tight end room. And again, realistically, say what you will, sell. he's taking up a spot that could belong to somebody that could turn into something great. If I'm not mistaken, James Harrison got cut out of his first camp. Uh, Jeff Saturday got cut out of his first camp. Kurt Warner got cut out of his first camp. I'm not saying the next James Harrison, Jeff Saturday, or Kurt Warner is on the Jacksonville Jaguar squad, but as long as Tim Tebow was on it, I know that they weren't going to find out if they were. So now that Tim Tebow is no longer on the roster, it at least makes some sense to the credibility. You no longer get that roster spot back, but at least you didn't cut somebody who may have materialized, who may have turned into that next Kurt Warner, that next James Harrison, that next Jeff Saturday. At least you give them one more opportunity. Last thing on my thoughts are this. Buck, you notice, so you notice. The objective, if you're in training camp and you are not a superstar, you're on the bottom tier like I was, is not to make the team. <clears throat> the objective is to make the league. When I was playing for the Philadelphia Eagles every training camp, I wasn't trying to make the Eagles roster. I was trying to make one of the NFL rosters, one of the other 31, along with the Eagles, so call it 32. Tim Tebow's only trying to make one roster, the Jaguars roster, because that was the only place he had an in. But Tim Tebow was robbing a player from potentially making one of the 32 teams because Tim Tebow was only trying to make the one. Here's the thing. Um... Whew. Uh, his opportunity, if I were on the team, would never bother me because it's only for the sorry players that he's fighting with. He's fighting with number 89, and he's fighting with number 91. Now, I like your point about James Harrison, Jeff Saturday, and Kurt Warner. But they needed those moments for several different reasons, and I'm going to hone in on one. That adversity can be a setback, but it also can make you improve. It can hone that focus. We don't know what happened in their first camp and what happened in their second camp. But we hear the story from afar and say, see, he deserved opportunity. How do you know? That first camp may not have went well, but that adversity, the fact that he did get cut, may have 
whip them into the shape. So I'm looking at this situation like Tim Tebow didn't rob anybody of anything. The cream rises to the top and the dreams sink to the bottom. If you ain't it in the NFL, nobody cares. And Tim Tebow now, you're in that position. And I get it. He didn't know how to block. And that's not why he got cut. He got cut more importantly because he didn't want to block. Now, me and Acho have been having like 98,000 conversations about this. And I used to have to go against guys who were, let's say, lower draft picks because they were backups. But they were the man in college. Like, you think six, seventh rounders, undrafted free agents can still be the man in college. Don't act like that. A starter, a two, three-year starter. But then he gets to the NFL and he hears about you. He's seen you play. He respects your reputation to the point of reverence or even deference. And then you line up against a guy who just last year was walking around campus as the big dog. But now he knows in the NFL he ain't. He's the little pup. And he caves to that moment. But sooner or later, he gets his legs under him, his confidence back, and realizes, oh, I could be the big dog on the big stage. But that's a process. The only thing I have an issue with with Tim Tebow getting cut right now, is that it just seems like it wasn't a process. A lot of offseason, a lot of practice reps, but one game for a guy who had special circumstances? So I would think if you were Urban Meyer, you would at least give him two games to live out those special circumstances. But I stand here corrected. And hey, Marcel, it's like, here's the thing, man. You know it. We, we've been in locker rooms. It is all fun and games. Until you play that first preseason game. That's real. The depth chart looks great. You have all the T-shirts and shorts, wonders, all the guys that we're excited about. But then when we tee it up for real and the coaches get a chance to put you on tape, the decisions come swiftly. <laughs> and the thing that got Tim Tebow cut, Twitter got Tim Tebow cut. Yes. Because when that clip went viral and everybody was talking about it, Thank Urban you. Meyer knew he was going to have to answer it. And Twitter, I blame the Twitterverse. Y'all got Tim Tebow cut. If that game was not on TV, mm, and if mm, someone mm. did not take the time mm, to mm, clip mm. that off and Preach. to let the world see it, Tim Tebow would still have a job, even though he was very finesseful at the point of attack. But you can't go out there wincing and whining and turning your back when you're mm. trying to block. Too many jokes, too many jokes to be had inside and outside the locker room. Urban Meyer had to cut the cord despite having one of his best players that he's ever had on the team, he had to send Tim Tebow pack. Well, Bucky, you're not wrong, but I don't necessarily believe that your right is an issue. Twitter did get Tim Tebow cut, but we've also seen social media justly do a lot of things that were existing prior. Like, we've seen social media properly do and lead to some decisions that should have been made in society. If y'all been watching the NFL, y'all know how it goes. Mm. There have been suspensions that have only been for two games, three games, one game, when later on the world sees video of said incident, and it's like, you know what? That was not a harsh enough punishment. Now, on this similar scale, Tim Tebow, he should not have been on the roster. Now that the world saw the video, we're all like, you know what? You keeping him as the 90th person but still on the roster, that is not a harsh enough punishment, if you will. So, Bucky, I think you're exactly right. I said it earlier. I agree with you. I now agree with Marcellus in the fact of Twitter did get Tim Tebow cut. But the fact is he shouldn't have been on the roster in the first place, seeing as he was literally the 90th person who now we know was on the roster primarily because of his relationship with the head coach. Man, man, this world, boy. Twitter got it wrong on this one, or at least they were premature to getting it right. Let's just say that. I remember going against Antonio Gates, undrafted. Hey, dog, where'd you play, uh, where'd you play football last year? I didn't play in college. Okay, you undrafted, and where'd you go? Kent State. Not Alabama. You didn't play football, you didn't play this position, and you right in front of me? Let me put some of these hands on you, big dog. Antonio Gates, Hall of Famer, 300 yards receiving his first year. Do you want to highlight how many times he missed a block in the preseason game one? I was there. I could see it. But we're going to do it to Tim Tebow because he's a superstar who leads our show and is in two different blocks. I respect it, but Urban Meyer should have been watching this show. He could have learned something from his boy over here. I tried to tell him, like, don't cave into this pressure. You got a team to run, not a social media account to run. However, Tim Tebow, respect to you, praises to you. 
because you were 34 years old trying to do something that Acho and I weren't doing at 34. I was hosting Sports Nation. Acho ain't even 34 yet. He was yet. equally as Coming unsuccessful. Up, Cam Newton <laughs> says he does not care about who the starting quarterback is in New England. I'll tell you if we were buying that. Next on Speak for Yourself, I had a mic in my hand. Cam Newton was called the starter earlier this offseason, and he's taken all the first team reps in training camp, but there appears to be some doubts. Matt Jones, who? Matt Jones has been turning heads so far, prompting Cam to be asked in various ways. Monday, if Bill Belichick has told him he's the starter for the season opener. Listen to this. Mm. Everything y'all know, I know. You know, there's no, there's no hidden motives or things like that. I do know those things like that I can't worry about because each and every day I don't necessarily care about who's starting. I mostly care about, you know, making sure that I put the best product out there for me. And I know Mac is feeling the same way. I know Brian is feeling the same way and everybody else going down each and every position. So, you know, as far as week one, we got so much to to to, to worry about prior to week one. And, and that's that's what my focus is right now. Hmm. Bucky is back. But Acho, are you buying Cam doesn't care about who's starting? Not at all. And I'm not convinced Cam's buying it. Y'all got to remember. Cam Newton said he only wanted to go to a team where he could be a starter, where he could for sure hold that throne. Cam Newton is a former league MVP, oh. former league MVP. What he looked like being a backup, being a backup particularly to a rookie, being a backup to a rookie that's not even a number one overall pick, not mm. a number two overall pick, a mid-round drafted rookie. So Cam Newton is First. getting paid like, starter adjacent money cam newton has gotten mvp to his name there is no way that cam newton would be content being a backup because he could have went to be a backup on any team he chose to go to new england because he knew at that place at that organization in new england he would be a starter so there's no way he'd be cool being a backup uh, i'm with you out y'all i'm buying that cam newton is sitting there this is why i'm buying that he ain't gonna trip but he cares. Now, there's a difference. A lot of people out there mistake this. All right. If you don't act out your concerns, you don't care. I go through this all the time with my wife. I don't act out a lot of concerns, but I do give a damn. Cam Newton gives a damn, but he's mature. Cam Newton does give a damn, but he's professional. He knows that going out there and acting like how he feels is not going to get him anywhere. You got to go perform the way you feel. And that's as simple as it gets. So take you back to my growing up, my L.A. mindset, watching all the homies around me. This is what we call he ain't set tripping. What is set tripping? Set tripping is when you're from the hood, but when you go somewhere else, you actually activate from the hood. Like, yo, what's up? Well, you really want issues, beef and commotion. Now, you can just care about the hood. And don't have to set trip. That's Cam right now. He care about his starting position, but he ain't going to set trip. But y'all want him to to show that he really cares. Uh-uh. Stay mature. Stay professional. And keep putting up those numbers, Cam. It'll speak for itself. Oh, I think this is everything that I want to see if I'm a Patriots fan and if I'm a Patriots front office exec. Mm. Cam is fully bought into the Patriots way. Everything that he says, those short sound bites that say nothing, is all about the team. It's team over me. It's about the process. It's about making sure that before I can even think about week one, we got so much work to do to improve. I'm trying to be a little bit better every day. Now, when we talk about this quarterback battle and competition, it's too soon for us to even know how they can be leaning. Because let's be real about Mac Jones. A lot of excitement created by Mac Jones' performance, that 13 for 19 for 87-yard performance, where he threw a lot of check downs and dink and dunks isolation route we don't know how good mac jones is mac jones is fine but i can't sit here and say that oh because of that one performance we need to give cam newton's job to mac jones yeah i'm not ready to say that especially when i look at mac jones's performance compared to those of the other four mm. that were taken in the first round meaning trevor lawrence Zach okay. wilson justin fields and trey lance those guys wowed me i can't say that i came away wild by Mac Jones. And so with that being in mind, Cam Newton is just doing what great leaders do. He's taking the message that the head coach would, no the head coach would normally utter, and he's representing that. He's focused on the next day, the next practice, the next play, and he knows that the starting job will play out the way that it's supposed to play out. Well, here's a problem, though, Bucky, that I have to bring forth is, let's remember, July 31st, 2021, head coach Bill Belichick said, Cam Newton is our starting quarterback. And now it appears 
at least, that Bill Belichick has to some degree changed his tone. Mm. At least his lesson, the confidence with which he has uttered that message, Cam Newton is our starting quarterback. So I don't know if Cam Newton is as chill as y'all are painting the picture. He's just saying the things that head coach Bill Belichick would want him to say. Because I do think Cam Newton heard, like we heard, those applause Mac Jones got, that standing ovation Mac Jones got when he jogged onto the field. Right. Cam Newton has heard, like we heard, Bill Belichick has changed his tone from his confidence of Cam Newton as our starting quarterback to now. You know, we'll, we'll just see what happens on opening day. So I don't think Cam is as confident mm. as we all seem to believe or as Bucky you would like to believe because Bill Belichick isn't confident no longer that Cam Newton's going to be the starter and Cam is not confident either. And does he care? Yeah, he cares, but he's not just fronting with this whole thing as though he's just talking because Bill Belichick wants him to. Uh, you know what, Asho, I think what you want, you want Cam Newton and Bill Belichick to be engaged in one of these relationships you have when you're in elementary school. <laughs> you know when you're in elementary school and you see the hot chick and you slide over the paper and you say, will you go with me? Check yes or no. <laughs> what you want is you want Bill Belichick to send that note to Cam every week. Cam already knows I'm good. Oh. I don't need you to tell me each and every week that we're in a relationship. We're locked up. You're my boo. That's what he's saying. You want that constant reassurance yeah. that, hey, I'm your lady. You're my guy. I got this. Cam is like, bro, I'm good. You told me it's good. Ooh. It's good until it's not good anymore. Oh, you over here, Lisa Random. He insecure up here. This sucker, <laughs> I need some confirmation about my situation. Hell no, nah, he a vet. He's smart. And I love it. It's two ways you can play it. He ain't tripping, but he cares, which is a vet move. Be professional, be mature. Man, people confuse that you ain't acting up. That means you don't care. He's like, I care, but I know what's up. Acho, you even mentioned this before. He's borrowing from your playbook. Whereas when you're on one team, you're auditioning for every team. Cam knows the writing's on the wall. He out of there after this year, no matter how he plays. So right now, in the midst of adversity, you better show some maturity, some professionalism, and some leadership for your future audition. And why should I be shook over Mac Jones? Who? Mac Jones, who went out there in five drives, gave him three punts and two field goals. If he take my job that way, then I know why he took my job. Kim was already his job to have. And I'm just up here trying to be the professional and leader. You can smell the uckery coming. And so if Cam Newton is going to be smart about it, navigating through these waters by being professional, we shouldn't be the ones that cut him down. Coming up, all eyes are on top of draft picks. Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson. Which one, Trevor? I see you stiff arming. But we'll tell you which quarterback has more pressure this season. That's next on Speed for yourself. The top two picks in this year's draft, Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson, had their first taste of NFL action over the weekend. Mm. Lawrence won six for nine for 71 yards, and Wilson was compared to the reigning MVP. His teammate, Josh Johnson, said, quote, he reminded me a lot of Aaron Rodgers with some of the throws he makes. So, Sal, let's talk fresh. Mm. Who has more pressure this season, Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson? Is Zach Wilson under pressure. Ding, ding, ding. ding, ding. Uh, let me tell you why. One, the Jets fan base is just irrational. I used to live in New York. I know the Jets fans. I used to play against them twice a year. They're irrational. Even if their team is not built for success, they think they should be successful. So that's a pressure-filled environment if you're the quarterback. The turnover at the position we've seen, obviously, that's pressure. Are you going to be finally the quarterback we need? Now, Zach Wilson goes out there and he's like, OK, we don't have that much, but we have something here. Now, who's our coach? Oh, he's a former defensive coordinator who's an unknown at this level in terms of being a head coach. So he's not going to take any of the pressure off me. If he fails, people are going to be like, well, we didn't know what he was supposed to be in the first place. His expectations are actually lower than Zach Wilson's. So all of this falls on Zach Wilson, who is now being compared to Aaron Rodgers in terms of some of the throws he can make. Think that's going to enhance the pressure or decrease the pressure? Point being, man, where he is, the expectations, and the lack of personnel, and a head coach who can't take some of that pressure off him, it's Zach Wilson and the Jets. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Oh, you the, the Jets... 
their expectations are so incredibly high, mm -hmm. and their results I don't anticipate being that high. And as a result, Zach Wilson has much more pressure. First and foremost, we all know consciously and subconsciously the Jaguars are bad. Like, we all know they have one playoff appearance in the last 13 seasons. Yes. In our minds, in our heads, with our eyes, we're like, you know what? The Jaguars are just not that good. But for whatever reason with the Jets, it's as though we have this fake sense of reality about mm -hmm. them. Like, we think they're much better like they're than they really are. <laughs> but Zach Wilson, he's the highest quarterback drafted from the Jets since Joe Namath. Yeah. He can take in number two. Drafted higher than Mark Sanchez. Drafted higher than Sam Darnold. So the pressure's already been high. He was also drafted from a small school. So it's not like he was a Justin Fields kind of guy. It's Preach. not like he was a Deshaun Watson when Deshaun was taken from Clemson later in the draft. Zach Wilson, it was like, wait a second. We're reaching for you because you went to BYU, but hmm. we're reaching for you because you are supposed to be that good. It's a lot of pressure. Hmm. The other thing, we've seen the number one overall pick not do great, or we've seen rather the top flight pick not do great. Even Peyton Manning, he was a top flight pick. But he struggled early on, and he still rebounded. Mm -hmm. If Trevor Lawrence were to struggle, he's been compared to the likes of Peyton Manning, John Elway, uh, uh, Andrew Luck. If he were to struggle, I think people would just chalk it up. Man, yeah. the Jags are so bad. What do you expect? But if Zach Wilson were to struggle, I think it would be a matter for the Jets of, here we go again, mm -hmm. another quarterback who's not going to be able to turn this franchise around. To me, that all screams pressure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Trevor Lawrence is sitting in a good position. You would think he would have more pressure just because he's the number one overall pick but the thing is the give up on him if he struggles it's gonna be a lot longer than it would be for Zach Wilson and he has a superstar head coach who is gonna take some of that pressure off him and who's already under some criticism under some fire Tim Tebow what's going on here so that's a shared experience down there in Jacksonville but to our point the last week for Zach Wilson answers this question already Remember he threw a couple of interceptions in practice, and then after the practice, he had to say, hey, it's practice, guys. I risk it in practice. That's what I got to do. But you can hear the fans in the background saying, pretty boy, fireman Ed and all them dudes, take Zach back. We don't want him. Now he goes out there and has a good game. You know what they're starting to say? It's the return of the Zach. I don't get it. Yes, fans, that don't make no sense. Coming up, Jalen Hurst is getting a lot of brotherly love from his teammates and Nacho friends back in Philly. I'll tell you how much we believe in the Eagles quarterback next. Oh, shit. Let's head to Philly. Okay, where Jalen Hurst has not officially been named a starter yet. The reports say there's a, quote, fast-growing sentiment among Eagles players that Jalen Hurts is undoubtedly the franchise quarterback. Went on to say players are consistently blown away by Hurts on and off the field. So, Acho, how much of a believer are you in Jalen Hurts? I'm a huge believer in Jalen Hurts. For me, so, no, no, but the, the, no, no, there's an additive. There's an additive. Uh -oh. I don't know if I am a believer in Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia Eagles this season. I got I to gotta level my expectations, because if I don't level my expectations, I will be disappointed. Yeah. Jalen Hurts only has four career starts. Let's make no mistake about that. It's not as though Jalen Hurts has been in the league for four years. He has four career starts. I do believe fervently that Jalen Hurts will have a much better professional career than college career. I think he has every attribute necessary to dominate in the league. Mm -hmm. But I also know his star receiver, Devontae Smith, Heisman winner, is out with an MCL injury. He came back today. I saw him jogging in practice. Good uh, job. Kudos. I need to see him sprinting in a game. Um, <laughs> but cool. I know he's out. Jalen Rager, first-round pick, underachieved last year, yes. but has been balling in camp. That's yes. what I've heard. So if Devontae Smith comes back full speed, if Jalen Rager continues to ball, not just in camp but in the regular season, sure. But you asking me about belief in Jalen Hurts when Jalen Hurts' success is actually interdependent on New head coach Nick Sirianni. Mm. It's in interdependent upon two first-round pick wide receivers who we haven't seen anything up from in the NFL season. It's interdependent on Zach Ertz. Is Zach Ertz content being in Philadelphia? Dallas Goddard, that's mm -hmm. who it appears Philly's trying to hand the torch to. Can he take the torch and be the number one tight end when every team knows he's supposed to be the number one tight end? I believe in Hurts, but I don't know if I believe in Hurts in Philly this year. I think it might need a little more time. Uh, I believe in Hurts. I'm a big believer in Hurts. I'm all in on Hurts. I'm all in on Hurts this year. I don't think they're going to win a division. I think that's the Dallas Cowboys. But let's remind ourselves what this division is. NFC least. Seven wins won last year. So they're going to be in the hunt because they are believers in Jalen Hurts. Think about what Jalen Hurts is doing. 
the mantra of football is a great game of skill, but a greater game of will. Well, he's going to have guys willing to fight for him. So they're going to extract the most out of themselves in a pursuit of trying to live up to what their leader is commanding. I like that about this team. I understand that there's some skill issues. I understand that there's some injury issues. But I also saw a guy who was on the bench the entire year until the last four weeks and then goes into that same lifeless offense and gives it life. That's special, man. As a rookie, and not even a first-round rookie, like a second-round rookie, you're replacing a $128 million franchise quarterback who had destroyed that offense and part of that team. And he resuscitated that. To me, that's the somebody you should believe in. But sometimes, Sel, and let's take the viewer down to the nuances, let's sometimes go. it's a little or a lot easier to do what Jalen Hurts did. Why? Defenses are not nearly as prepared. We know that oh, for yeah. Jalen Hurts. We have no game tape on you, Jalen Hurts. We got all the tape in the world on Carson Wentz. You don't count Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> That's this? the first thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, the second thing is Jalen Hurts last year was competing from a place of having nothing to lose. Facts. Right, like you're the backup. You're not Facts. supposed to take Carson Wentz's right. job. You can go out there and if you suck, okay, not a big deal. If you play well, great. You're now going to be the starter. This year he's competing from a place of a big dog. Mm. You're supposed to be the man. We don't even really have a backup. Joe Flacco hasn't taken one first team snap all camp. Mm. It's all on you. So I'm not going to fully make a decision upon Hurts based upon those four games last year. I'm not all of a sudden like Taylor Heineke needs to be a starter in the league because of what he did in the playoffs versus the Buccaneers. Good I'm point. cognizant of the fact that Bucks didn't have much tape on Heineke, so he can go out there for 300 yards in one game. But what can you do week in, week out, day in, day out? You've said it before about different people. Mm. There's a difference in being a guest on our show and trying to host this show. It gets a little bit different. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between being a guest at the starting quarterback position mm. and being the starting quarterback. It's a little bit different. Yeah, but Jalen Hurst is different. First of all, let's just give respect to his family. You know, you can just see somebody sometimes and be like, damn, you were raised right. This dude got character. I just love it. And it shows no matter what the circumstances are, what the situation is. He's 39-7 and seven as a starting quarterback going back to college. 26 and 2 at Alabama, you leave there. 12 and 2 at Oklahoma, you leave there. You go to the Eagles, you're 1 and 3, but in games you started 1 and 2, and you actually outperformed the franchise quarterback. What I see from Jalen Hurst is not him being a guest on the show and then a host, him being like me, just hosting a gang of shows and always doing it good and doing it good because you were raised right. Coming up, Kevin Durant is getting some shade thrown his way. I don't want to do this about his hair. <laughs> Looking like Jesse Owens Park up in there. We'll tell you how you should handle it next on Speak for Yourself. Y'all need to wet that grass, bruh. <laughs> Evan Fournier is new to the Knicks, but is not entering New York quietly. Fournier and France recently lost to Kevin Durant and Team USA, but he still took a shot at the Nets superstar. Fournier tweeted, Now I need the best barber in New York City because I need help, LOL. Someone on Twitter responded, quote, fella named Kevin, he's in Brooklyn. <laughs> you over here giggling up. You can't even read. <laughs> fella in New York, he's in Brooklyn. He cut you up in Tokyo. Oh, man. Maybe he can do it again. That's so cold-blooded. Man, that is. Uh, Fournier clapped wow. back, tweeting, quote, he needs a barber too. Damn. So, Sal, how should KD handle this? Uh, I think KD shouldn't care, just like he doesn't care about his hair. It's being real. like, And I respect KD for doing this because I see this happening, especially with the wealthy. It's called understated arrogance. It's when they just come out dressed bummy, don't care about their hair, don't do anything. And what you going to say? What you going to do? Because he's KD. He don't need to impress you because he doesn't care about you. Uh, man, yeah, he got to let this one go, big dog. Yeah, First off, go. Fournier just clapped back, and it wasn't even really aggressive. He didn't say that he didn't get cut by KD. He was like, you know what? I did get cut by KD in in, 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 a, in a gold medal hole competition. Yeah. You need a barber, too. Yeah, you need a barber, too. Get yours chopped I up. Tomorrow, That's it for us. Dog. We'll see you tomorrow. You rusty up in here. Rusty.